I hope your day is going well in that you appreciated our keynote with Eric Moraes from STL this morning, the transit on demand panel, the discussion on natural gas buses and the exhibit on our Rutai tool. Welcome to this great keynote session with Stephanie Madero, head of global e-mobility accounts for ABB, our exclusive sponsor. Stephanie will take us through the amazing world of ABB. So over to you, Stephanie, for your presentation. Thank you, Magali. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Maderos, as Magali said, and I lead the e-mobility global accounts team at ABB. I'm based in Montreal, and I work with fleet electrification projects all over the world. So it's a very exciting world to be in because there's so many great projects happening. It's my pleasure to be with you here all today. And before I begin, of course, I have to sincerely thank Dr. Josipo Petrovnik at, and QTRIC as well for bringing us all together and for inviting ABB to be, search, to be part of such a great and important event. It's clear that climate change is on everyone's mind and agenda. And in 2020, while the world was going through an unprecedented pandemic, global energy related carbon emissions fell by 5.8%, which is almost two gigatons of carbon dioxide. That's thanks to reduced demand for oil, coal, and gas. But unfortunately, that was short-lived. And the International Energy Agency predicts that energy-related carbon dioxide emissions will rise to 33 gigatons in 2021, which is a significant increase. This will be the largest increase since 2010, when after the global financial crisis of 2007-2009, Governments poured cash into carbon intensive projects in an effort to pull their economies out of the recession. The 2020 pandemic curveball brought its own share of challenges. However, it also brings us with opportunities. One of the most notable is to build a safer, greener, and more sustainable infrastructure and economy, and resulting in a better world for all of us. Next slide, please. So today we're going to cover a few things. The first, the current state across the globe and Canada's current place in the race towards 2030 zero emission targets. I'll share my vision for a green, safe and affordable infrastructure for Canadians and how sustainable transport is at the heart of this green infrastructure. I'll also talk about ABB and its presence across the globe and the country. I'll speak about the elements of a green future and the overall big picture of this. And finally, I'll share some key takeaways before we move on to the Q&A session where I can hear and chat with you guys about all your, your questions. Next slide, please. So with COP26 fast approaching, countries around the world are making their 2030 climate pledges. And 2030 is a significant milestone in regards to climate change because it's often cited as the year where climate changes become irreversible. It's the point of no return, as I'm sure you've heard as well. And so countries are coming together around the world and committing to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. And there's so many great examples of countries that are doing this and leading the way. The first that I'd like to talk about is the US. So the Biden administration pledges to slash greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030. Japan pledges to curb GHG emissions by 46% by 2030. And India vows to install 450 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030. As you can see, in order to tackle climate change, this is a group effort. No one can do this by themselves and everyone has to do their part, including governments and countries, individuals, as well as companies. And there's so many great examples of companies around the world coming together to make their commitments of reducing their carbon emissions. There's the Climate Pledge founded by Amazon, where 53 companies representing almost every sector of the economy have committed to net zero carbon emissions by 2040. The EV100 initiative, it's an initiative that's a global one, bringing together forward-looking companies committed to accelerating the transition to electric vehicles. And ABB, ABB sustainability plan, their 2030 sustainability plan is to achieve carbon neutrality in its own operations by 2030. And as well, ABB helps customers to reduce their annual CO2 emissions by at least 100 megatons. That's equivalent to the annual emissions of 30 million combustion engine cars. So it, as you can see, there's promising steps forward on the global scale. 
And if we take a, a look at this side of the world in Canada, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has now committed Canada to reduce its national emissions by 40 to 45 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. And that's a notable increase from the previous target of 30 percent that was by 2030. These reductions are going to be seen in buildings, increase in renewable energy, and of course, in transport. And Canada is reducing this amount in transport by making historic investments in public transit, including 2.75 billion to switch to public transit systems to electric power. It's also establishing light duty zero emission vehicle policy sales targets of 10% by 2025, 30% by 2030, and 100% by 2040. It's also providing purchase incentives of up to $5,000 on eligible zero emission vehicles. These are just to name a few. Next slide, please. And these emissions and reducing initiatives in Canada are so important because about 25% of emissions come from transport. So clearly this will go a long way in cleaning up the air for all of us Canadians. Green infrastructure investments are also key to post-pandemic economic recovery commitments of the Canadian federal government, and they'll also create lip ripple effects in the value chain to ensure that local communities retain economic and environmental benefits and allows building strong communities across countries and deliver a better quality for all Canadians. Also, a healthy environment and a strong economy go hand in hand. Green infrastructure investments have the potential to help achieve GHG reductions across various sectors and can drive innovation and growth by increasing technology development and adoption as well uh, as increase in uh, jobs in the long term. So all of this really ensures Canadian businesses are competitive in a global low carbon economy. So overall, green infrastructure is a winning solution for all Canadians. Next slide. When looking at the whole green infrastructure picture, electric buses are very important and are a key factor. As we've seen mentioned a few times during this conference and in the industry in general, there are cost savings with electric buses versus diesel fueled buses from lower fuel costs, maintenance costs are lower since battery, battery electric buses have less moving parts. Um, also, battery prices are falling significantly, where today's battery prices are about $100 per kilowatt hour and will continue to decrease. And over the years, the upfront cost of a battery electric bus will be on par with an internal combustion engine bus. It'll also result in job creation and promote economic growth now and throughout the recovery. So overall, electric buses are definitely a key contributor to the fight against climate change. And Canada right now is an ideal landscape for green trans transit and green transport. As Minister Catherine McKenna, Catherine McKenna said in yesterday's welcome address and government keynote for this conference, in Canada, we have a great story to tell about public transit. And this is true, especially with the announcement of the federal government to invest the 2.75 billion for electric buses. As well, Canada has a wealth of electric vehicle manufacturers in Canada for Canada. Canada is home to at least six electric bus manufacturers, five of which, which are New Flyer Industries, Nova Bus, Green Power Motor Company, the Lion Electric Company, and Grand West are Canadian owned. Also, Lion Electric hopes to set up a battery plant in Canada in the next couple of years. So clearly there's so much positive movement with these OEMs in Canada. As well with the support of Qtrix initiatives to educate and raise awareness among industry stakeholders, it's really helping break down barriers and make green transit in Canada a reality. Next slide, please. And if we look at ABB, ABB has a large role in green infrastructure and in general, a long history in innovation. ABB is the leading global technology company that energizes and transforms the energy and society and industry to achieve a more productive and sustainable future. And this is done by connecting software to its electrification, robotics, automation and motion solutions while pushing the boundaries of technology and innovation for 130 years to drive performance to new levels. 
And in e-mobility specifically, we engineer the electrification solutions for the transport of tomorrow, and we're doing this today. This includes smart transportation solutions for EV chargers for home, electrified depots uh, and fleets and opportunity chargers for electric buses and trucks, to high power chargers for highway stations of the future. And pushing the boundaries of technology and innovation, it's really key. Technology and innovation are important to enable a green future. This is why the industry is working together on technologies today that are going to be ready for a green future. The ABB Formula E has a large role in advancing e-mobility and a green future. ABB Formula E is more than just a race. The founder of Formula E, Mr. Alejandro Agag, has said that the car that you see pictured here on the right of the slide, this is not just a race car, it's a weapon against climate change. It's a pretty bold statement, and it's absolutely true. The Formula E races are accelerating the adoption of electric transport by creating awareness since the races happen right in city centers. And also it's a test bed for e-mobility technologies. The newest e-mobility technologies are being tested and pushed to the limits right there on the racetrack. Then those improvements are brought to the mass market vehicles and EV chargers as well that you and I can drive and can charge our vehicles with. This is of course very focused on passenger cars mostly, but as we know, a lot of innovations and standards that started in the automotive industry have trickled down to electric, tech, electric bus technologies and other electric transport as well. And that we can see from technology in the batteries to powertrain and charging technology as well. So the technology improvements, improvements of Formula E have the potential to have a profound effect on all modes of electric road transportation. What's also important for new technologies or innovations are pilot projects and demonstrations to showcase and prove the new technologies. One example of this is the Pan-Canadian Battery Electric Bus Demonstration and Integration Trial, which demonstrates the interoperability of opportunity charging by having different bus manufacturers charge with different opportunity chargers. And this is important because interoperability is an important factor in the acceleration of adoption of e-mobility. When we speak of a green future and the transport of the future, we're also speaking about autonomous ready technology. Electric autonomous vehicles will need autonomous or human free charging to make it truly autonomous. Overhead pantograph charging allows for automated charging. And along with the Pan-Canadian electric bus demonstration, and in Canada, there's the indoor depot pantograph charging system at Edmonton Transit Service, that's a great showcase of this, where overnight charging of the buses is hands-free and already has automatic charging capabilities since it doesn't need a person to physically plug in the bus to charge. So when driverless buses will be on the roads, this depot will be ready to charge these buses automatically. And we're not so far away from autonomous buses. Nova Bus and New Flyer, to name a few, have already been testing their autonomous platforms. And outside of transit, we see autonomous vehicles and charging progress pro projects all over the world, such as autonomous logistic vehicles in ports, such as the one in Singapore, where charging infrastructure is automated by using robotic arms on autonomous vehicles. So these innovations are happening right now, and it's really great to see that Canada is an active player in moving these technologies ahead. So to support with these innovations in Canada, we'll turn on to the next slide, please. ABB has for more than a century been investing in Canadian technologies and products to support the development of local businesses. And our North American Center of Excellence in e-mobility is located in Montreal and supports the development of sustainable transport networks and brings together transit operators, power utilities, and engineering experts to address the challenges related to building, smart cities, and energy efficient mobility solutions for Canada. In this center, a team of local engineers and R&D staff are working together to make sure global technologies are suitable for Canadian environments, such as 600 volt inputs for bus charging infrastructure. Social progress is an important topic for, for ABB as well. And one statistic that I'm proud of is the diversity within ABB Canada. 
Across the country, we employ close to 3,000 employees, and they're all from 60 different nationalities, and 30% of the employees overall are female. And this is really important because, yes, a green future needs technology, innovation. Green future also needs diversity. It's really important that diverse teams tackle tomorrow's climate change problems. And having more women, as well as people with different backgrounds involved, will bring about more creative solutions and lead to success in finding these solutions. So a diverse workforce and an industry is really important. And there's so many amazing organizations working on promoting diversity in the transit and transport industry, as well as all other, other industries as well. So I'll name a few. So Qtric, of course, I, I love to mention Qtric because they've made a gender parity, but they've made gender parity and diversity as a core value. And they've been a very active advocate in gender parity within the organization and the, the transit industry in general. Uh, especially with yesterday's announcement of, and partnering with University of Windsor to launch the gender parity in the Canadian transit industry study. Another organization is, is Movi. It's a company, Movi. Um, it's an organization, it's a shared mobility company based in Vancouver that has projects all around the world and has created also the Women in Smart Mobility program to highlight and support a women-led venture in the smart mobility space. CEO is a Canadian organization that has global reach. It supports and celebrates women-led ventures who are working on the world sustainability to-do list. And it's an organization of which I'm a very proud activator. Dress for Success is another organization and it supports women who want to get back into the workforce. And they do this by helping, finding, helping women find jobs and creating webinars and learning sessions for women to teach them the skills that they need. Those are just to mention a few, but clearly a more diverse workforce and industry will mean more successes. And it's really great to see Canada is, has so many wonderful organizations promoting and encouraging diversity at a local and at a global scale. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at the big picture, of a green future, we need to look at all the elements. Sustainable transport is an important one, which I've already covered. I'm sure that it was very covered also during this conference. There's also smart buildings. And in smart buildings, you know, buildings really contribute up to 35% of Canada's carbon emissions. So it can be part of a green future solution by improving the energy efficiency performance and shifting energy and shifting to a more energy efficient building is regarded as an increasingly critical component in carbon reduction strategies. And smart cities, the battle against climate change will be won or lost in cities and smart cities are the solution to optimize energy use. So technology, innovation, and of course diversity are all important factors to, to enable green future and to make smart transport smart buildings and smart cities are reality. Another important factor that I'd like to leave you all with is mindset. It's our collective commitment to make a change. We as citizens have a moral obligation to change our habits and to contribute to the fight against climate change in this larger ecosystem. So taking small actions can have long lasting and greater impact. Consider daily actions such as recycling or composting, taking your bike or public transit versus taking your car. And if you really have to drive, then switch to an electric vehicle. We can all do our part in helping to fight climate change and small changes in our daily habits are done by everyone and will amplify our positive impact overall. So in closing, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Um, and I'd like to share also five key takeaways from this presentation. So we'll move on to the last slide, please. So the first takeaway is the global pandemic accelerated the need to rebuild a safer, greener, and more sustainable infrastructure and economy. The green infrastructure investments are key to achieving post-pandemic economic and recovery commitments. Also, electric buses and transit are an important part of a green, safe, and sustainable future. And as I mentioned, technology, innovation, diversity, and mindset are important factors to enable a green future. 
And lastly, behavioral changes are required from all of us. So as I leave you today, I encourage you to all think about what actions will you take? Because the time is now. So let's write the future together. Thank you so much. And that concludes my part. And I'm very interested and excited for the Q&A session. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. That was great, great insights and lots to talk about. So we have some actually really good questions. So let's get started. How does Formula E translate into transit, into electric buses technology? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, Formula E, it's, it's a test bed for e-mobility technologies. That's one of the major reasons why so many of the vehicle manufacturers join as teams because they have their newest technologies that are used in the car uh, and they're really pushed to the limits because Formula E in itself is a really unique, it, it's a racetrack, right? And so these technologies, these newest innovations are really pushed to the limits and they get these, these teams, the racing teams get so much valuable data and information back. Uh, so basically what they do is they take that and then these improvements are brought to their mass market vehicles. So again, that's one of the, the big reasons why the car OEMs want to get involved. And this is of course on the car side, but what we know is that that'll also translate eventually to other modes of transportation or electric mobility. So one of the things is, you know, efficiencies that we see in the powertrain, because most of the cars that we see, the electric cars that we see on the road now have 400 volt powertrains, uh, but the premium vehicles, the vehicles that are coming are, and already, you know, on the roads are vehicles that have 800 volt powertrains. And so the cars, the Formula E cars have a powertrain that's above 800 volts. And that's also what heavy duty vehicles that's the voltage that of the powertrains of the heavy duty vehicles. So there are efficiencies that will be used and will be translated to, to other parts. What's really kind of fascinating to me about how fast these improvements are taken from the racetrack to the vehicles is that it's the speed that this happens because in other, other motorsports, um, very popular ones that you, you all probably watch um, that are happening right now, these types of innovations take a long time. It can take almost you know, five to 10 years. In Formula E, there's been improvements that, ha that happen in as low as two years. Uh, so that's a really, really big shift and advancements that's, that's coming. Uh, so I mentioned already the powertrain and also in the ba battery technologies. So there's new batteries that are being used. And so the lessons learned and the information that we can get and the lessons learned can be brought into other modes of transport as well, including transit. That's on the car itself. And then when we look at outside of the car, there's the charging side, for example. And again, what's really interesting about Formula E, it's a very unique application where charging happens really, really in a fast, but also in a very fast paced environment. So it's a great opportunity to take chargers and really push them to their limits. And all of those lessons learned can be taken to the other chargers that are installed all over the world. So there's a huge potential for lots of synergies and lots of lessons learned in the Formula E racetrack to be taken to the chargers and also the vehicles all around the world in transit. Great, and if, well, I have another question. If Formula E is a, a good test bench for you guys, do you have other projects you're working on that could be like te test benches other than Formula Within, E? Other than Formula E? Well, first I'll say Formula E, you know, when you look at Formula E, you look at it as a race of the vehicle and, and obviously the vehicle comes with the charging. So there's a lot of technologies, as I mentioned already, that can be tested and pushed to the limits. When we look at outside of the car, there's so many other technologies that happen because essentially these races, they're, they go from city to city um, and they're plugged in, you know, the, the charging infrastructure, but then also the, the other infrastructure that you see at the race, it basically, it basically just plugs in either to the grid, uh, either, either to battery energy storage. So it's different types of, you know, um, service to these. And also each race is kind of like a mini microgrid you can think of. So there's other technologies such as battery energy storage, 
um, that could be tested. Um, and then there's also UPS. So ABB is also providing UPS systems to the ABB Formula E races, and those are un uninterruptible power supplies. And so it allows for the race, in, if in case the power quality is so great, or if there's a, a glitch in uh, or a blip in, in the service to make sure that the racing never goes off air. So that's just examples of other technologies that we provide to the races themselves. And then other than that, I mean, that's like I said, Formula E is super unique. Um, because a lot of ABB's equipment or most of ABB's equipment or the industry's equipment is pretty much just installed in one place, it's commissioned, it's turned on, and then it just stays there for many, many, many years. So again, Formula E is, is a very different type of application. But I will say that you know, aside from that, ABB's equipment um, is installed in all different parts of the world. So either from super cold, you know, countries that have their own challenges and even super hot countries that have their, their challenges and also in different altitudes. So having about 20,000 EV chargers installed all over the world really plays to lots of important data that we get back. Excellent. That brings us maybe to another subject, smart cities. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, more project you're involved in? Because that's really interesting. And I'm sure a lot of our members are really interested by smart cities. So there's a lot of really great initiatives that we're working on in smart cities. And so the first thing that I'll, I'll do is I'll say, you know, I'll, I can explain it, but I, I definitely can't explain it as best as going to the ABB site. And I believe it's abb.com slash smart cities. And it gives a full view of what ABB does or what industries can do when it comes to smart cities. So there's different aspects. So there's the, the smart city in, in general, obviously as a whole is the big picture. And then you have the smart building and then smart transport that really go hand in hand. So there's lots of great solutions. Um, and I know we don't have, you know, I, I can, I think smart cities in itself can be its own entire topic. So I definitely don't have that much time. Um, and that's why I'll just say, just go to our website and it just, it's a very, very visually pleasing way of informing everyone on that. I actually have a question from the audience here. How might charging infrastructure be integrated into the broader urban form? Well, that's an interesting question. It's a good question. So there's different ways. I think the first thing is that when you think of charging, and, and charging of the future, you know, many more people are going to have electric cars and are going to do the switch to EV. The first thing is that as much as possible, electric vehicle, electric vehicle charging should be as seamless and convenient as possible. And when I say seamless, and that's the beauty of having an electric car versus an in internal combustion engine car is that you no longer have to go to a fuel pump. So charging can happen wherever you are. So it can happen at home, obviously, so overnight charging, or it can happen when you go, let's say, to a mall or a coffee shop. And so those are the opportunities for, for charging. Obviously, if you're taking a long road trip, uh, you're traveling across Canada, then you would stop at one of the highway charging, so the really, really fast charging. Um, and where technology is going right now is that charging is going to happen in can happen in eight minutes or less. So that's pretty much the same time or just a bit higher than the, the time that it takes to fuel at a pump. So when you're also integrating charging into you know, the, the, the big picture or into a city, there's different things that you have to look at. Obviously the type of charging that, that you need, again, to be as seamless as possible. Um, and I think there's, I'll point out an opportunity here because AI or data, I should say, is gonna be a lot more valuable compared to having a car where, you, where it's internal combustion engine because when you have a vehicle that needs to be charged and you'll go to a, let's say on curbside street parking, there's so much data that's interrelated, especially for cities who, like I'm, I'm based in Montreal and in Montreal, we have parking meters that are, I, I pretty much just to pay for parking, I just go on my app and then I, I pay for mark parking that way. So that type of data, when you're relating it to charging, will really give a lot of data and information, I should say, to the city itself. 
because then the city can realize what type of charger that they need. If they see that on average people are parking for about an hour or two, then maybe installing a 50 kilowatt charger or around that would make sense. If it's higher, if people are staying there for eight hours or more, then installing maybe a slow charger or a level two charger would make sense. So again, I guess to summarize, I think what's really important is that whatever mode of, of charging that's being installed, it has to be as seamless as possible. And then the other thing is that there's a really great opportunity for um, data coming up to fill this big picture. Well, thank you so much. I think we covered a lot of subject today. And um, thank you very much, Stephanie, for your time, your generosity. We appreciate it very much. Thanks for sharing about climate plan formulae and diversity. Uh, and we look forward to hearing more about ABB in the future. So thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much.